Hello, podcast listeners. Have you ever been the victim of a scam? Well, good news. In this episode of JJ Meets World, we're going to talk about how I, JJ, your host with the most, was a victim of a scam. And by the way, if you'd like to help support our podcast, visit JJMeetsWorld.com where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some killer swag at our merch shop, or click the link to Apple Podcast and give us a five-star review. One, two, three, four. <laughs> J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always sniffing out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. On this episode of JJ Meets World, I'm going to hop on top of a soapbox and tell you about a company that is currently screwing event attendees and event promoters across the entire country. We should call these segments like JJ writes a strongly worded letter or something. It is some variation of it. And I've written several strongly worded letters and they've gone nowhere. So now I'm taking to podcasting about it. That's how deep (laughs) down the rabbit hole we are with this. So before I get into where we are now, I need to tell you where we've been for, I'd say the last five years, I've been using a service for line benders when we do a public show called brownpapertickets.com. It is an online ticketing source that allows promoters like me to put an event on their platform for free and then People can buy tickets through their platform online and I recoup the entire ticket amount. So if I set tickets at $20, every time they sell a ticket, I'm going to get $20 and then they charge a convenience fee on top of that, which I believe is just a flat dollar twenty five per ticket. Now, here's the brilliance of it. With the exception of putting the website together... They don't really have any other cost associated with what they do. Sure. Um, You know, the only time they would incur a cost like a credit card transaction fee, they're already getting their dollar 25 off of it every time. Now, and is that just passed on to the person who's purchasing it at the point of sale? Correct. Okay. So, for instance, what we would used to do for a line bender show is if we want people to pay $10, we would charge $8 and 75 cents for the ticket and knowing you'd pay a dollar 25 transaction fee, making it an even $10 when you get charged. Now, okay. Their business model said you will get, you don't get any installments before the event. You get paid after the event. So 10 day, business days after the event, they will issue you a check and that check will be made out to whatever entity you want. They'll pop it in the mail. Bada bing, bada boom, you're good to go. Things with brown paper tickets worked out great for the most part. The only time I ever had an issue was we had to cancel an event because of um, because of a blizzard. And so we had to issue refunds because we just, you know, usually when we do a public show with line benders, which is my improv comedy troupe, we don't reschedule another one immediately, right? Because we've had to figure out a place to hold it. And we've had to, you know, it, it, there's a lot that goes into planning an actual like event that takes place on a single evening. So I remember having to pay them like $2 a ticket to refund it, which I can understand, right? Because they've already paid the credit card processing fees, um, they have to refund their dollar twenty five convenience fee back to the person, so they need to make something off of the deal, and I'm sure that that was in the fine print. So, like I said, we've used them many times, and they've got unique things where you can print your tickets at home. They've got a mobile app, so your tickets can come to a mobile app. I'm alerted every time there's a ticket sale that takes place. I get alerted when I've hit uh, three quarter capacity. I've got an alert when it gets sold out. They have uh, an opportunity for me to have promo codes so that people can actually get their tickets for free. So if I am sending tickets to a client, they don't even pay the convenience fee. Technically, Brown Paper Tickets even has a a deal where if you are charging zero dollars for the event, they don't charge a convenience fee. 
So if you just need wow. a way to like gather, you know, online ticketing for a free event, they're not even going to charge you for that. So it seems like this company really had a v- event promoters in mind when they put it together and things worked out beautifully for a long time. Fast forward to Valentine's Day 2020. Now, this is in an era where we've only really heard of COVID-19 as something that's affecting China and cruise ships seem to be, you know, having troubles with what's going on. But certainly nothing that has uh, has hinted towards the shutdown that we ended up having in March. So. We had a line bender show for Valentine's Day. It's one of our biggest shows of the year. It's a great date night. We can charge a premium for tickets. We had two sold out shows and the amount uh, of tickets ended up being somewhere around thirteen hundred dollars in sales. This is at Fargo Billiards and Gastro Pub. Everything went great. Now, when I do a show for the public, I have to take out a special insurance policy. And I pay for that insurance policy up front. We printed posters and I bought some at online advertising. And so that's something I paid for up front, knowing that even if I spent five hundred dollars on this event, I was still going to recoup that plus, you know, a- another good chunk because these shows are so consistently sold out. So we do our show on Valentine's Day, and I don't actually end up getting a check until the beginning of March, which I thought was kind of weird. So I get a check on a Saturday and I head to the bank on a Monday. I deposit the check. I go to work. While I'm at work that day, I get an email from Brown Paper Tickets saying, unfortunately, we you know do not cash that check. We do not have the funds to cover that check right now. Because everyone is canceling their events left, right, up and down. We don't have any income. Oh, wow. Right. And so my first thought is like, well, it shouldn't matter about canceled events right now because you've already collected all the money for this show. This show already took place. You already got the convenience fees. So, my- so they're basically their cash flow when they when their cash flow got hit, they kind of let uh they robbed Peter to pay Paul for a little bit. And so when your money first went in there, they used it to pay out someone else. Right. And they were like, well, now we can't pay you out because our, our funds are too low. Right. Which and, you know, and they don't say we're using it to pay other events. They just said, you know, we're unable to process that payment. Right. right now. To me, but, but in and out, like, like, like you just said, the money is there, right? Like, like the money exists. You had sent it to them. They just needed to take out their piece and send you yours back. Right. And and not even take out their piece because their piece is collected separately, even though it's in the same transaction as mine. Oh, does that right, make sense? Sure. Right. So like when, yep. when Tucker Lucas buys two tickets for him and his lady friend, they already they collect my part of the money and then they collect their I part like of the, the money. I like that. I have a lady friend in this scenario. Let's make more <laughs> scenarios like that where I've got a lady friend. Sure. So Tucker Lucas and his lady friend love our show. They have a great <laughs> time and they can't wait to come to another line bender show. So I think to myself, you know what? First of all, it seems like a Ponzi scheme to me. Like, isn't that the definition of a Ponzi scheme where you're collecting money to pay off other debts without, oh, yeah, you absolutely. know, without it being there. But I think, you know what? This is an unprecedented time for everybody. I'm going to let this slide for a little bit, and I'm sure once they get back on their feet, they'll you know make things happen. Because at that time, you know, uh, Disney World, I remember calling Disney or Disneyland because we had a vacation book there and they told me I couldn't get a refund because this park was going to be open and everything is going to be fine. And then two hours later, they actually closed the park and then they gave me a refund. So it's unprecedented. That's the only way you can describe it. So let's fast forward to June, June. I still have not received any information, nor have I been paid and things are kind of starting back up. People aren't really having events, but the world is opening. You know, there are some people who are going out and about and they're road tripping across America, staying in RVs and doing all sorts of stuff. So I email them. No response. Wait a week. Email them. No response. Then I read a letter like an article in the Seattle Times about brown paper tickets and how 
there are a lot of very angry event promoters and attendees who never got a refund from brown paper tickets. So now I start to think, you know, let's say this. Let's say that there were a hundred events like mine, which is not unheard of to think that there were a hundred events that took place that didn't get paid out. Mine was fifteen hundred dollars. So let's just use the math of they had one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that they needed to pay out. So I'm sitting there waiting to figure out what's going to happen after the Seattle Times article comes out talking about all these people being screwed. The CEO of Brown Paper Tickets sent an email and said, gosh, you know, we we fired half the people who worked for us. Um there's no there's no income. We have absolutely no income taking place right now. And we are sorry for the lack of communication. And we should have been more upfront with everybody. And that was our mistake. And so let's, you know, we're, we're working as hard as we can to make this better. Fast forward to August. Still nothing. Still oh, August nothing. already. huh? Wow. And now people are getting pissed. And I join a. Facebook group, a closed Facebook group called Stiffed by Brown Paper Tickets. <laughs> and there it's a group of people who start sharing their stories. And I realize I am on the very, very low end. There are people like small community theaters who uh, had a fundraiser in January and it was worth thirty thousand dollars in tickets that have not been paid. 30,000. Could you imagine what $30,000 means to an arts organization especially uh, as a member of an yeah, as a member of an arts organization that's life or death. Right. And then think about it in a year then where there's no other way to make up that money. So, they're sitting on this wealth, this fortune. So, I uh I start following a case that starts being made by the Attorney General's office in washington state now uh brown paper JJ? tickets is based in, yeah i'm gonna go pee but i'm still listening okay there's still uh there's still an open case even to this day with the attorney general's office in the state of washington and they start seriously looking into brown paper tickets at no time does brown paper tickets actually shut down or declare bankruptcy, and I am assuming that they got some uh, payroll protection funds during this whole time. So other people who don't know about brown paper tickets, bad habits, are hosting events and being stiffed by them. So if you hosted an event in August, an outside socially, physically distance event in August, there are people in this group who haven't been paid from that. So even in a time when they knew that they owed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to promoters, they are still continuing to operate and telling people, yeah, you can use our service and then withholding all of the money from them. That is some very dirty business. This, is there any sort of class action lawsuit going on? So right now? there are no words yet on a class action lawsuit, because I think everyone is assuming that the attorney general in Washington state would do something to help them at the very least shut down their operations, you know, and, and pretty much figure out what they've got for assets, break it apart and start giving it to uh, the people that they owe money to. Um, right. Because they're still continuing to operate under this falsehood that yes, we can make this business model work of where we pay you and, and yada, yada, yada. So October of this year, I send the final email to Brown Paper Tickets and I lay out that I am very dissatisfied. It's been almost a year. My event happened before COVID-19 hit and caused a shutdown. Um, I expect to get my money back. No response, no response, no response. I call their phone number. Nobody ever answers their phone number. And there's just there's nothing. I have called my financial institution, which, by the way, charged me a $25 fee for cancer or for uh, depositing a check that was bad. So it's not like they canceled this check. They did. They pulled the money out of their bank account so that this check was uncashable. So I got the fee that like not like an overdraft fee, but like a bounce check fee on my account because their check didn't clear. So now they owe me $1,325. It, make, it makes you wonder, you know, how long would this scheme have kept going if COVID hadn't happened? Because I could see, you know, 
people whose names we don't know who may have had vested interests in this company and they're running it into the ground and they realize they've got this cliff they're coming up to. And then they've got something like COVID-19 that might be a really easy scapegoat for the moment to say, Oh, look, this happened. That's why our business isn't, isn't really working. Um, but, uh, that, that fraud can only last for so long. I wonder too, how many other businesses, uh, are, are perpetuating schemes like this. And it, it goes to show that how, one hitch in the giddy up can, you know, can cause the whole building to fall because this was just, you know, this is a situation where they did. They knew they didn't even have two weeks. Like if a government shutdown lasted for two weeks uh, to, to cover this. And to me, what it is, is there's probably a CEO or an owner of this company who is living high on the hog, you know, hasn't had really anything to deal with when it comes down to having to take hardships from this. In fact, um, there's a good chance they're getting away Scott clean. Right. And so in, in this group I'm a part of on Facebook, one of the things is they said, like, have you done a door knock on the CEO of this website? And that (laughs) the, the term means that have you actually gone to the, this guy's host house and knocked on his door and just to see like can you get an answer from him straight up and a lot of people have said no we haven't and here's the biggest issue that i see this is a company that does business online and uses mobile apps email so it has a presence in every state in the united states but it's headquartered out of one state so This last month, I contacted the attorney general's office of North Dakota, somebody who is a public official who I guess in my mind, I thought was supposed to be able to help with scams, because at this point, I would say I've been scammed in this situation. And it it doesn't matter what state you're in necessarily. It's like if the scammers and I don't know how the system works. So like if the scanner is in another state, you're state's attorney general's office will go to bat for you is the idea. The, and, and that was the simply the question I asked. I said, listen, I know I'm going to have to engage in some kind of legal battle to get my money back because a couple of people on this thread have said, I found success by filing a small claims court, but I had to drive from uh, Tacoma, Washington to Seattle to be able to uh, do this. Well, by the time I get to Seattle, file a small claims, allow the two weeks for that thing to be done. If I'm in a hotel, I'm out money, right? Like there's no way this amount of money I can ever get made whole if I, if I follow that route. So the question I asked the attorney general in the state of North Dakota is since the event took place in North Dakota, I am a North Dakota resident who is owed this money and they are an online entity can I sue them in my local small claims court? Because I know that from time to time you can do something like that. So take like a, uh, take like a, a Dayton's right. Like, so Dayton's department store, if it still was around, if you uh, bought something from Dayton's and it was full of dog poop when you, when you bought it and you wanted to sue them, you could sue them because the transaction took place in your state, like at your local Dayton's in your state, you're a resident of that state, and they were choosing to do business there, even though their headquarters was in Minnesota. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that was the question that I asked them. And I laid out the whole situation and I got an email about 30 minutes after I sent it saying we cannot advise you on any legal claims. And I said, well, I'm not looking for legal advice. Like I'm not asking like, Hey, how do I sue them? I am asking you, does our North Dakota court system allow me to sue an entity from another state while I'm in it? And their advice back for that was you need to contact a lawyer and they will be able to advise you. We can't do anything. So, okay. So then I'm thinking, Okay, but this is a business who scammed me out of money and is continuing to operate and you're allowing them to continue to operate in our state. You know, and I thought of like studs to rugs, studs to rugs was a construction company who is taking money from people uh, for future projects to pay off current projects. And right. when they hit a like a, a, bl- a blip, 
they were unable to complete all this stuff, even though they had collected money for this. To me, it is the exact same situation. And the North Dakota attorney general was all over that and they shut that business down. But (laughs) I think because I am a little guy and quite frankly, they don't understand what's going on, nor do they probably care what's going on. Mm. They're not going to help me in this situation. So now I am left at a point of where I have to hire an attorney who, let's face it, I'm going to pay almost $1,000 to an attorney to get to the point of where I might recoup $1,300. Right. You know, unless someone wants to take this case on pro bono or, as you asked earlier, they end up making a class action lawsuit that I can join. Right. right. That would be the only thing I could even think of was that. Hence, you have the class action, right? If you have a ton of plaintiffs who, you know, maybe individually their their grievance isn't massive, but together it shows like a giant grievance. Right. Um, yeah. That, that would seem to be maybe your course of action. Is that the only course of action you have at this point? How much how much exactly total are you owed? So the exact amount is one thousand two hundred and sixty dollars. And then I would tack on the extra twenty five dollars in the check return fee that i was charged by my bank yeah i mean there's no way you you recoup any of that after going to court with a lawyer and anything even if i had to file something i would still have to serve them with papers in in seattle and so this is i i just don't know what 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 to do at this point like i'm just kind of dumbfounded at this point and again going back to the brown stiffed by brown paper tickets page. I'm going to tell I'm uh, uh, beg my indulgence here for a moment. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that are it. shared in this thread. So uh, they owe us nearly $8,000 since March have of course done all the right things, contacting the better business bureau, Washington state's attorney's office, Pennsylvania state attorney's office, my Senator newspapers. Now I'm in the process of contacting a lawyer, total insanity. So this is somebody who had an event in March owed over $8,000 at this point. Bought tickets in December of 2019 for an event for June of 2020. Still crickets from brown paper tickets. I am out nearly $9,000 with still no word from them. I'm hoping that either they or the Washington AG are clever enough to figure out a way to use federal relief funding for the arts to pay out what is owed. Not optimistic about brown paper tickets doing so. However, because that would take admitting that the problem is they don't have our money. And that's the thing that frustrates me the most. They have spent this money. They have used this money as part of a runway, probably to continue keeping salaries. You could go to this website right now and set up an event, Tucker. You could set up Tucker Co. and Tucker Fest and people could buy tickets And you could have the event and they still wouldn't come through with paying you for it. And and just a heads up to Tucker Fest is basically just a bunch of readings. So I wouldn't get too excited about that one. Well, what's the meal situation? Uh, uh, Floppy cheese sandwiches. Okay, I mean, there's someone who wants to buy that. I'm just drawing from Fire Festival. (laughs) That's all I'm doing. Uh, I love. Well, so Tucker Fest is just like Fire Fest, only it's on the mainland. Yeah, it's low key. It's pretty mild. Mm, yeah. No one has high expectations of it. It's more like, well, hey, at least we're at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that when it boils down to it, I am st- I'm stuck. I'm never going to see this money and there will never be any kind of justice for my case. And when people wonder why folks don't trust the justice system in this in you know in the United States there are people who are both elected and hired to to stop these things from happening once they've happened and i can tell you this much the attorney general's office of washington as well as north dakota have not done what i feel they're supposed to be doing which is investigating this as a scam and stopping it. And I feel like, do we, do we have to contact the United States attorney general? Like, do we need to get a national spotlight put onto this? And well, at, the, at the very, at the very least, it would be really nice if the attorney general's office of North Dakota 
could just answer a simple question from one of the citizens, which is, I'm wondering, you know, how how does your office function in situations like this? Right. And what is your office's view of this particular situation? It, just just those opinions. I mean, the, the notion that they've taken in the information, processed it and responded, it may very well be that they go, listen, we would love to, but here's some, you know, archaic thing that is stopping us in the scenario or something. At the very least, they would respond to you and give you the dignity of going, we recognize that you've been screwed and that's wrong. Um, and we would do something. We just can't because of this. At the very least, you would have that information. But right now, all they've done is said, get a lawyer. And it's like, well, there's a there's a clear reason why that's a problem. Right. Because you're trying to recoup about a, about a, a 1.2K and that's usually the typical cost of even sitting down with a lawyer for an hour. So um, just the notion that that, hey, get a lawyer, kid, is is a really, really silly response. Have you ever been a part of a class action lawsuit, Tucker? I think I was like inadvertently one time that I didn't realize uh, it, it was something to do with, I don't know, MacBook batteries or something. I think I clicked a check mark on an email I got once. I was like, did you ever own a computer between this time and that time? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I clicked it. And then months later, I got a check in the mail for like 22 cents. Yep. So and it said that I was part of some class action thing that I must have agreed to. I wasn't aware of. So technically, yes, I have been part of a class action lawsuit. I wasn't aware that I was part of it until I got paid. My so I've been a part of several, including that MacBook expanding battery one. Um, that must have been what it was. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And my favorite class action lawsuit that I've been a part of was against Star Kissed Tuna. I like how you have enough that you're like, well, my favorite yeah. class action lawsuit. He, this, <laughs> this was my favorite. This is why this one like speaks to me. So Star Kissed <laughs> Tuna, someone found out that they had been labeling their cans as like 3.5 ounces, but really you were only getting 3.2 ounces of tuna per can. And this okay. had been going on for so long. Meaning the rest of it was water. It was like just water weight. Yeah. Was it the yeah. Rest of it? Or, or empty air. You know, it, like, you think of like a bag of chips, right? You open up a bag of chips and it's never as many chips as the bag right. could hold. Like they could have been weighing the cans after they were fully filled and sealed. And so, well, now it's 3.5 ounces. Yep. You know it, baby. So. Uh, so they you could go on to this website and become a member of this class action lawsuit. You don't have to prove that you ever bought tuna. You just have to say at some point you bought some tuna and you were probably screwed out of a couple, you know, tenths of an ounce of tuna. So a year and a half goes by and I get an email saying, OK, so we're at the final stages of this class action lawsuit and you can either choose a cash settlement, which will be split amongst all people who claim that they were a part of this or star kiss tuna would offer to buy you three cans of tuna. <laughs> can you guess which what one? Was the payout? I, well, can you guess which one I chose? Um, I think a normal person would take the payout, but I think you took the tuna. I took the tuna and this is yeah. why I took the tuna. So in other class action lawsuits I've been uh, been with, I've been like you, where I receive a check for a dollar or 22 cents or at most maybe like three dollars because a class action lawsuit by its nature pays out big to the lawyers who are doing it because they are doing it without charge because they know that there's a big payday for them claiming up to like half of the right. total like winnings. That's watch Aaron Brockovich. That's what the whole movie's about. <laughs> <laughs> they learn all about class action lawsuits and about hexavalent chromium. So I decided, you know what? If I go with the three cans of tuna, I have something to show for it. I probably, let's say in the best case scenario, I get $5. I've got to go to a bank. I've got to cash that check. And you know what? I probably won't spend it on tuna. So I spent, I said $3 or I'll take three cans of tuna expecting them to send me three cans to my house. I don't know why I thought that, but they sent me a um, like a coupon for go into any grocery store and you can have. Three so you cans still had to do the leg work. You still had to yeah, do the leg work. Still had to go and get the tuna. Um, But I felt that when I bought, when I got the tuna and I handed them the slip, the clerk there was like, oh yeah, we've seen a couple of these come in today. And I thought, good, take that big tuna. You sons of bitches. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, like you can't screw the little guy and get away with it forever. And justice always wins. I, I, I guess the whole point of this episode of JJ meets world is just for me to be able to, to vent a little bit about getting screwed. And the fact that a big company can continue screwing other people and the people in the government are take, aren't taking the time to stop that. Instead, they're doing things like putting uh, friggin bills into the North Dakota state house saying, because you citizens took away my ability to eat with lobbyists, I now have to eat spaghetti out of a can. So I think you should give me <laughs> per diem so I can go to whichever Hardee's I choose every single day. No, <laughs> no, man. Come on. Well, well JJ, so it, it, it sucks. Your money got stolen. Yeah. And you'll, pro you'll probably never see it again. Um, but uh, uh, in the words of Annie, the sun will come out tomorrow. Um, what is next now for line benders when it comes to this type of service? Because you're you, regardless of what happens, you're still a business that needs to sell tickets. Yep. So do you, do you know what you're going to do now? Is there another service out there? And do you think along those same lines, you know, the deal that, What's it called? Brown paper ticket? Yep. I mean, you know, maybe that was a deal that was just too good to be true. And that was that's that was part of it. But I don't know. I don't know how that system functions. The way you laid it out to me, it makes sense. And it's hard to know what the actual business needs are for a company that does that because Ticketmaster was gouging people for so long that there's never been a real way to quantify, you know, what is the actual cost here. So is there another service that's out there? Or if there isn't, what would you like to see from a service there, that does this? There are so many of these ticketing services out there and they operate in different ways. Some of them say, we'll sell your tickets and then we get 20% of whatever you sell. There are so they only make money if you make money. There's other companies that have a flat rate up to a certain dollar amount and then it goes up from there. So, for example, if your tickets are under twenty dollars, they're going to collect a dollar fifty. If they're over from twenty to a hundred, they're going to collect three dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have my choice of going on and doing this. But quite frankly, I was bitten by a shark. In, you know, in the ocean, I don't, it doesn't matter which part of the ocean I go into. I'm going to be afraid of being bitten by a shark again. And so I don't trust any of these online ticket companies anymore, especially not now where I have found out that their business is so volatile that they don't have anything set up to be able to continue this operation the way it needs to be held. So that being said, I think my plan going forward will be to use um, Square. Square is, of course, you okay. know, the the we use that for running credit cards uh, on site when people buy tickets there. Because here's the other thing, too. Tucker, you you're in events. You want someone to buy a ticket in advance for two big reasons. Number one, mm -hmm. it secures them their seat so that they're guaranteed to get in when they get there. Yep. Number two. Getting someone to buy their tickets in advance solidifies the fact that they will be there. Um, yeah, how you, many, you've you've basically you've basically it 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 changes the questions of will this be successful cash flow wise potentially? Um, because the big risk is well, hopefully people will show up. But if they're buying tickets, then you know ahead of time that they are, and you can also make some decisions with that information. Like, do we need to open up more seating, or do we have too much seating? We can close some of it off. You know, X Y Z. I think that to me, uh, you know, you can go on a Facebook event and a hundred people can click attending, but really that turns into five people actually attending. Um, so it, it, I mean, there's a reason why tickets are sold in advance to everything from Broadway shows to Bruce Springsteen concerts to line benders performances. Um, it makes sense. So I think we're going to have to take it into our own hands and use something like Square, and I'll have to pay someone to set up essentially a portal on our website that will allow people to make a purchase of tickets into it. Now, that changes everything drastically for me because I'm going to have to monitor the amount of tickets and say, gosh, you know, our inventory for this is only 75 tickets. So once we get to 60 purchases, I might have to turn it off. 
so well, let's no let's play a, let, let's play a little hypothetical mind game here then jj let's assume for the moment that the future ceo of bestticketsonline.com is listening to this episode right now if you could talk to that future ceo of bestticketsonline.com what are what do you need them to do? What does their service need to do for them to be attractive to a business like yours? They need to have a weekly payout to us. So I get paid for tickets that are sold regardless of the timeline. So I don't have to wait until after the show is done to recoup some oh, of that sure. money. So right. Like, 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 like the money's already, you guys have it. Let's just process it and get it through. And then it's done. There's no questions. About right. It. Exactly. And he, there's no anxiety of where is that money right now? Am I getting it in time? Yes. Yeah, Square, Square, I think does it great because they deposit whatever you charge, whatever's charged to your Square account the next business day. And so, you know, so best paper, best ticket company CEO, Tucker Lucas, would have to come up with something like that. Now that puts a lot more pressure and I would have to, I would be taking more risk because if the event does get canceled, I would be on the hook for having to refund all of these people. Right. I can guarantee you, I will never be the CEO of a ticketing company or probably any company, but that's very nice that in this hypothetical, can I have a lady friend too in this hypothetical CEO? No, and his lady you've got friend. a chimpanzee friend who helped oh, you. Damn it. Yeah. Damn it. Oh, fine. Um, and he smokes cigarettes. He's a chimpanzee that smokes <laughs> cigarettes and wear and wears pants, but no shirt. Does he, roll, does he ro- does he roll his own cigarettes? Yeah, of course he does. But but for but for acorns, you gotta feed him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that would, uh, you know, no matter what, I'm I've been burned, right? And right. it doesn't mean that I will never do a live event again. In fact, I mean, let's uh, let me throw this out there. This is huge news for us. And it's also sad at the same time. And I've had a real tough time coming to grips with this. In May of 2021, the line benders celebrates its 20th anniversary. Oh, no way. Yeah. 20 years uh, since Marty Jonasson put an ad in the Fargo forum saying, do you like improv? Come to this audition and you can be a part of a brand new professional improv group. We've performed from coast to coast. We were a fundraising arm for the Wounded Warrior Project. We have had so much fun making things up as we go along and having a 20 year anniversary during a pandemic. I only hope that before the end of the year, we're able to have enough people vaccinated where we can have a good old fashioned improv show somewhere or a couple nights of it. So that I can welcome back performers who haven't performed in a while and we can just be awesome celebrate. And here's the here's the thing I think is interesting. We'll go from having our final show and being screwed out of thirteen hundred dollars by brown paper tickets, a.k.a. the devil's ticketing agency (laughs) to having our 20th anniversary performance. So if that's not like the most whirlwind turnaround, I don't know what is. And 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 oh, and it's just like even the more I talk about it, the more I get angry. And I will also be the one to tell you this. This is going to sound like I'm gloating and it's not, but it's just the reality of the situation for us. Thirteen hundred dollars doesn't make or break us. We have a, we've been very fortunate over the last few years to be very business savvy and have turned our performance into several different types of entertainment. And we have a great nest egg built up so much so that we never applied for payroll protection. We never had to, of course, get any PPE money. We haven't needed any assistance from the U.S. government during this time and have been able to survive off of the savings that we have at this point and will be able to through the end of 2021, partially because our overhead is so low, but also because we made good decisions and we were, you know, when we would do a public performance, none of the performers got paid for a public show. They got some comp tickets, but we put all that money into a savings account so that three or four times a year, we could take a huge trip as a group down to, let's say the twin cities and watch improv all weekend and everyone eats and stays and it's all paid for by the company. So it's awesome. It is awesome. Also, 
the last three years, we have paid out over $50,000 to the performers in line vendors each year. I guarantee you there's not another arts organization in North Dakota that can claim that. Right. And a lot of people in those, a lot of those organizations will say what we don't do is art (laughs) or what we do is not art. Uh, (laughs) It's just silly corporate entertainment, but it pays well. Um, They're jelly. They're just jelly. They're just jelly. Um, But that, that being said, even this last year, because we, we didn't do post proms, we didn't have a corporate Christmas season. We didn't have uh, retreats during the summer. We didn't have a uh, comedy club opportunities. That's $50,000 that didn't hit our local economy. Just in purely in the amount of money that the performers are being paid that they could spend at stores and restaurants and on trips and things like that. And right, I, right. I, I think people forget how there is, you know, there's a direct correlation between people losing a part time job. And in this case, it's a part time job where you get to make fart jokes. Um, but that and then what's being, you know, what people can spend. So, you know, JJ, in our in our part of the country, both in on the uh, west and east banks of the Red River, uh, we've always heard all sorts of talk all the time about, hey, let's start this new performing center, right? And all these groups in town will be able to use it and blah, 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 blah. It's, it's, uh, I've heard that for the last 15, 20 years. And it feels like it's mostly talk. It feels like it's, you know, artists dreaming out loud, which makes sense. Like we would love to have a place that was ours to, to use, but then it never materializes. I mean, it, do you think... Do you think we're just like huffing paint and looking at this issue wrong? Because obviously in brown paper tickets or whatever the hell they're called is a perfect example. You know, cash flow is king if you want to live. And none of our nonprofit arts organizations, mine included, has been able to generate a level of cash flow for a massive amount of growth. We pretty much keep the lights on. And if you don't have any cash flow or a a significant amount um, that you're netting, then good luck keeping a space going. So where are you on that whole topic right now? And I mean, you've got a really interesting vantage point because you have an arts organization and, and screw anyone who says improv is not art. That person does not know what they're talking about. Um, Improv is, is one of the purest forms of performance art and I'll fight anyone who disagrees. Um, but, uh, you know, but because you're a nonprofit, because you are for profit and because you have low overhead, you know, your, your balance sheets a little bit different than other people at the end of the day, you've got more flexibility in a lot of ways than other people do, uh, just compared to groups like theater B or FMCT. So I know I'm throwing a lot of questions at you, but where, where do you stand on that topic? right? Sure. Now? So I think it's a matter of scale. And I think you're right. There's not a single arts organization in this area that could scale to the point of needing a 2000 seat venue, which is ultimately what they what they want to build. Right. This performing arts center where you could have things like touring Broadway shows, you could have musicians, um, you know, to, uh, 2000 seats. Just to give an idea to some of the people who are in the local area, it would be twice and then a little bit more. Uh, the size of the Fargo theater, but not quite the seating of blue stem. So, which is an outdoor venue. I think that a performing arts center is a great idea. And I think that it brings, um, it brings a lot to the community. It's hard to quantify how much it would bring in revenue to the community, but you just need to go to downtown Minneapolis on the day when the book of Mormon or Hamilton is coming through town to see how many people are filling the parking ramps and eating at the restaurants and yada, yada, yada. Um, But that being said for Fargo, there's not a single entity that could scale to that and be in charge of it. Because I mean, effectively it's the same thing as sports in that it's event based. So does your event draw a crowd? And so uh, even though there are, you know, each of these groups in in the FM area, we all have our own small little audience that kind of helps sustain us. But no one is reaching even FMCT at their most popular when they're when their house is full. They're not probably reaching a capacity level um, of event wise. And so it makes sense in one hand to go, well, let's pool all these audiences and these groups into this one space and localize that traffic flow. Um, but then at the same time, it's like, 
who gets time when. Right. Because a lot of, especially in theater, when you need rehearsal space and other things like that, you're always competing for space. And one thing we also found too in the past when Theater B had a space that we shared with Tin Roof is that it was really difficult to differentiate in the public's mind between Theater B and Tin Roof. They saw just the theater and thought, well, the theater is the theater. And I'm watching the same company every single time when I go up there. Yeah. I also think to some extent too, um, there's just there's just not an an audience for a 2000 you know for theater b to do a show that has a, a 2000 people in attendance is a daunting thing to think about right like if you think about uh totally it, you know if you if you guys are half full it seems like you're pretty full inside your th- your current theater space but right if you had 50 people or a hundred people that showed up in a 2000 seat venue, it would seem like, what's the point. Now, that being said, this performing arts center should be something where you've got this grand house and then you've got these offshoot spaces. You know, my, my idea years ago was when the safari movie theater in Moorhead was up for grabs, I thought the city of Moorhead should buy it and let something like theater B run it. Theater one, which is the theater immediately to the left of the lobby, remains a movie house. And on the right side, you've got four theaters. The two theaters on the outermost edges are turned into stage theaters. And then the two spaces in between become a shop and office spaces. You've got a a great lobby. You've got a great parking lot, a huge marquee. It would have been an amazing mixed use performing arts center. And a church saw that ability and now a a church runs it. Right. And that great purchase on their part. In fact, if I knew that they only wanted eight hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for that building, I would have been like, you guys can have a million from me. Um, I would have loved to have gotten my hands on that space. But I think we also are looking to Fargo for all of these things. West Fargo, step up. Moorhead, this should, you know, you've got that old Herberger space. Think of what you could do if you did something with that. And performing arts isn't just going and watching Shakespeare. Performing arts can be bands. It can be comedians. It can be uh, uh, summer programs for kids. Uh, It can be programs for vulnerable adults. There's so much that could go into a space like that, that I think our community needs it. Do we need six more sheets of ice for hockey? If you ask a hockey person, they're going to say yes. Uh, But if you ask someone like me, I only go to the Shields Arena every now and then, you know, like and I certainly we're kind of need it. We're kind of up to our necks in hockey rinks in this part of the world. Right. And I've been to shows at the Fargo Dome where they bring in touring Broadway shows that are filled like there's tons of people there. Is that a great venue? No, it's a football arena where they're trying to sing any songs. Right. Uh, the sun will come out tomorrow. <clears throat> Be like, oh, I guess someone scored a goal. <laughs> um, it, Annie's really part of this episode. now. Really? It really is. L- little orphan Annie. I think that uh, which, by the way, I just bought the board game adaptation of the movie Annie where your goal is to get adopted at the end <laughs> the old one or the new one the new one or the old one it's like from 1983 okay. it's a Parker Brothers game we should play it sometime Um, so I guess to me it's should we have a performing arts venue absolutely what should that look like well it's going to have to be a public private partnership you can't ex- you know like here's the I think the problem Arts groups expect the city to put up a ton of money so that they can have this playground. And when you go back and you look at some of like the theaters that have struggled to survive over the decades, the city, the city has no obligation to buy a building and give it to you. The city's obligation is to help you make that into a, you know, that, that dream into a success. So for example, when we when the line benders were looking at taking a space on South University Drive, it was the city of Fargo who ultimately shut it down and not because they didn't want to see an arts organization, but because they told us, like, feasibly, the landlord here is trying to sell you a bad bill of sale. They're trying to trick you into renting this space that'll never be able to be a performing arts venue. Right. And so the city, so they, they, they defended you. They said yep. they, they helped you out. Yep. So the city saved me. 
Um, big, big shout out to the planning commission on that one. And they and they've repeatedly told me they're like, listen, you let us know whenever there's something you want to do and we're going to do our best to try and help you find what that is. And so it would be great if we could have something like that. We also, you know, like, let's throw it out there. We have a local company that owns a ticketing agency. Tickets 300 is locally like locally owned. Right now, they should be reaching out to every arts organization and saying, like, listen, I know that you're in unprecedented times. And if someone from Tickets 300 listens to this podcast, reach out to me. Let's have a conversation Um, because I would rather do a business with something locally than to someone who's never going to see my money again or, you know, never going to see the money come back to a local level again. So we're just it's a it's a difficult time and yeah we got screwed out of thirteen hundred dollars and i'm now wiser because of it but Mm -hmm. it it's still it gets my goat it's i am pissed off every single time i open our checking statement and i Mm -hmm. i think about like this should be thirteen hundred dollars more and i also it also sucks too because i think of all the things that we do that help support our community that this takes away from so for example when i get a call from um, when I get a call from a, a group who says we're putting on a fundraiser because our friend had a stroke and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to buy him a van so that he can get in and out of the van easier. We always offset those shows because I still pay performers. We offset those shows through things like our public shows. And so if I'm going to pay $500 to the people who are performing, it's nice because I can... I can I can do that. And and this takes away from something like that. Sure. Right. So, right. So, yeah. So brown paper tickets dot com. And if you are a lawyer who's listening to this, who wants to take this case out <laughs> for free or at least just give me some advice. I'm not even saying that you need to do it. If you could just over a cup of coffee, say, like, listen, you can sue them in our small claims court and you can go to the small business legal help team. And, you know, it's full of college students and lawyers who got caught having DUIs who weren't sentenced to coaching hockey teams. Uh, You know, like this is where you can go and they can provide some legal advice and it's going to cost, it's going to cost you $20 for this form, $20 for this form. And here's the number of a sheriff who loves to serve papers on his off time. That would wouldn't wouldn't, Okay. But JJ, if they got back to you and said, okay, JJ, we can pay you out in one of two ways. We can either give you the exact amount that we owe you, or we're going to send Emilio Estevez to Fargo and he's going to teach the linebenders how to play hockey. Well, it's going to be Emilio Estevez. Okay. I just wanted Great. to make sure that you were still the. I just wanted to make sure you're still the JJ that we know and love hey, because things like this could really change a person. You know, they could really mm-hmm. get angry, lash out. And we don't want that. Hey, you want to know something that really gets my goat? Speaking of other things that piss me off. <laughs> okay. So there's a Mighty Ducks television series that's coming to Disney Plus with Emilio Estevez. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, and it's like, and you're, you're upset about this? No. Well, here's what I'm upset about Emilio Estevez, after the events of the third film where he only shows up for a little bit, if I'm not mistaken, because the third one's where they go to college or prep school or whatever. So something after the Olympics. He is now a, he runs like a skating rink and like coaches in minnesota still but none of it's filmed in minnesota they throw a gophers like sweatshirt on this guy and they pretend they're in minnesota i one of the reasons i loved the other mighty ducks is because it's full of stuff that i recognize like when they're skiing through the mall of america in d2 i was like i've been to the mall of america is it uh, tax incentives? Is that why? It They're is. In it is. And we don't even have to get into that whole ball of wax because we know yeah. I've got opinions on tax incentives for filming in North Dakota. <laughs> but I also think like, can't. I mean, at this point, Canada just has has the upper hand because they've got so many productions rolling up there that they've got the the infrastructure needed to create those things. So, yeah. Well, it, but also too, I mean, this, that industry is moving so fast and so crazy and changes. So, uh, so everywhere that who knows how long even these tax incentives are, are going to last in the structures that they are, um, because it, production can be moved to just about anywhere now. And, uh, you know, and a lot of it, including technologies like the, uh, like the volume 
you know, really changed the game in a lot of ways. So not that they were using that for downtown Boston, but that's going to happen at some point. The notion of shooting on location has become more and more rare. Will it will over time. I don't think it's going to go away, but I think it's definitely going to become more rare. Which famous celebrity is going to purchase the technology used to create the volume so that they can feel more at home when they're in their home in LA. So like a Mark Wahlberg who wants to go back to Boston and he's going to be, so he can just pretend like he walks down the street of Boston and it feels like he's in Boston. It's going to be Jaleel white and he's just going to recreate the set of family matters. Yeah. Go back to the 1990s. Just be like, this is where I was in my element. This was when I was worshiped and the, the cupboards are only filled with, Urkelos or whatever they were called. Did you know that Family Matters was a spinoff of Perfect oh, Strangers? Yeah. yeah, I was obsessed with Perfect Strangers. And I remember the first episode of Family Matters I saw. And I was like, that's Harriet Winslow. What is she doing in this show? Oh, is this her family? Oh, which is funny. And I, uh, Harriet was never like the, the like main subject matter on that show, even though she was the one who bridged the gap. Well, she was supposed to be. I mean, it was supposed to really surround her and no one saw the inevitable rise of the Steve Urkel. It's a rare condition these day and age to read any good news on the newspaper page. (laughs) Wasn't her job at the newspaper to press the elevator button? Yeah. She like she was the elevator operator, which, by the way, have you (laughs) been in an elevator that still requires an operator? I've only been in one bathroom that had an operator. Oh, uh, never been in an elevator that had an operator. I love bathroom attendants. I've been in many a bathroom with a bathroom attendant and they're the person you know all the secrets. Also, yeah. They're like think about their their poor job is just having to sit there and listen to people have yeah. like the grumpies. They have the they they deserve the biggest tips. Yeah, they really do. They do. Also, they really do. when they have got like a, a a classy thing in a bathroom is to see like a cologne tray. You ever see that? Right. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I'm the kind of person who I don't want that person to lose money who has that job, but I also don't want their service because the one time that was happening, I didn't realize it was happening at first. I was like, who the fuck is this guy giving me stuff? <laughs> like I wasn't, I had no idea what was going on. And then when it was done, I was like, oh, I'm supposed to feel fancy about that. But I just feel like my space was violated. Like I don't need a stranger's help when I'm in the public restroom. <laughs> in fact, I was taught to refuse strangers' helps in the bathroom if I was a kid. The f- the fanciest bathroom I've ever been in had two attendants, one who was just a towel attendant and one who had like the mints and everything like that. And what would happen was you'd come out of the bathroom, wash your hands, and then you'd look for a towel left and right. And then this guy would suddenly be there and he would take the towel and place it over your hands and he would rub the outside like I'm a little kid Whoa. getting out of the bath and he would dry your hands for you. And let me tell you, when you make eye contact with that man, there's no <laughs> breaking it without seeming awkward. His job is to come into contact with hands that were just touching genitals and feces Yep, and smile. And that's, about that's, it. that's pretty rough. I think there should be an attendant in the stall who coaches you through the process of defecating and then comments on your stool when it's done. You mean like Tom Arnold and Austin Powers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was his role. Uh, I just had a brilliant idea, Tucker. This hit me with it. The CEO of Brown Paper Tickets should be sentenced to five years of having to be a towel attendant. Just to serve. That's what we need. Let's call the AG. Right. I love I love judges who do the eye for an eye. And, and, you know, the punishment fits the crime in some way, shape or form, like the judge in Mighty Ducks. Oh, my God. All of this is just coming full circle today. Um, so in, on that note, if you are interested in reading more about this, you can still find articles about this brown paper tickets uh, in the Seattle Sun-Times. Uh, if you want to join that Facebook group, it is a private group. It currently has 676 members, but uh, they don't really want more other than you. They want you to be there. They probably don't want the big wigs of brown paper tickets checking in on all our plans. Um, 
but you can join that as well. And for more information, you can go to your local library. Well, they will point you towards a computer with the internet on <laughs> it. This is a really, really helpful call to action. At the end. <laughs> it is, <isn't laughs> Jay, Jay. So if you guys are interested in more of this, uh, there'll probably be news articles left on the internet for a while. They'll stick around for a long time. And uh, if you have a library in your town, you know, if it's open, you can always check that out. Wear a mask. <laughs> they have they have stuff. Otherwise, just start asking people while they're walking on the street. Have you heard of brown ticket bags? Yeah, brown ticket bag mans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that this was well worth your time to listen to because now <laughs> you're a smarter person. And if you continue to use brown paper tickets, I, in fact, maybe that's what I should have been doing is encouraging people to use brown paper tickets so that they could pay off their old debts so they could pay me and then screw you for a year. Uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see. I don't wish that on anyone. That's ridiculous. Um, so, you know, just do what you, just do what you have to do, you guys, and, uh, and live happy lives and don't sit and stew on things like I do. That's the whole purpose of me getting out into this podcast so I can stop thinking about it anymore and just be done. So that's what I got to say about that. The flying V. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes each week, visit JJMeetsWorld.com, where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some swag at the merch shop, or follow our link to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the sites the cool kids are using these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by visiting moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, check out linebenders.com where you can find direct contact info for JJ or booking information. Brown paper tickets goes by BPT, which should be Bud's pooping together.